We'll build a land where we bind up the broken. We'll build a land where the captives go free. Where the oil of gladness dissolves a morning. Oh, we'll build a promised land that can be. and all those who mourn and we'll give them garlands instead of ashes oh we'll build a land where peace is born land of the land where sisters and brothers anointed by love may then create peace we're just a shallow down like waters, peace like an ever flowing stream. We'll be a land building up ancient cities, raising up devastations from old, restoring ruins of generations. Oh, we'll build a land of people so bold. Where the mantles of praises resound from spirits once faint and once weak. Where like oaks of righteousness sound her people, oh come build the land, my people we see. Come build the land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace. Where just a shell roll down like waters, in peace like an ever flowing stream. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to South Church. I'm the Reverend Susan Sahaske Brown. I am the transitional minister here at South Church in Portsmouth, and I'm so delighted that you're here to join us this morning for virtual worship. We hope all is well with you and your family. We hold you in our thoughts and prayers, and please know that we think about you and we're here for you. Each Sunday worship service happens because we have lots of good people that are contributing. And it is my pleasure to work with worship associates. And this morning, I had the pleasure of working with Hillary Clark. Hillary, could you please introduce yourself and the program? Okay, thank you, Susan. Um, good morning. I'm pleased to be with you this morning in my role as one of eight uh, worship associates who work with Reverend Susan and our Director of Lifespan Ministries, Kirsten Hunter, our musicians and staff to create worship for you each week. The story for all ages will be told by our religious education staff this week. And for music, we have our director of um, music, Joanne Conley, who will tell you what else we have in store. Joanne? Thanks. Thank you, Hillary. Yes, we continue with our theme of listening this month. And we're so happy always on this fourth Sunday to have South Church folks sing with us one of their favorite Paul Comes to New England and other themed songs for us this morning. I also want to put in a plug for the next virtual choir we just heard last Sunday for Music Sunday. I hope you'll join us. Contact me or Theo, and we're working on a holiday-themed piece for December. Hope to see you there. Anything else, Hillary? 
Well, I wanted to let people know that if you attend services regularly, welcome. And if you're tuning in for the first time, a special welcome to you. After the service, there will be a virtual coffee hour. And the link for that is in the email you received last night or this morning and is on our members and friends Facebook page. Reverend Susan is generally in the pulpit twice a month as she is this week. But on other Sundays, we will hear from Kirsten or from guest speakers from within and outside our congregation. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Reverend Susan. Susan, back to you. Thank you. One more thing before we start worship. October 21st was International Pronouns Day. And as we settle into our service this morning, we thought it would be fun to share a great tutorial that we found about why pronouns matter. And more importantly, how to ask folks about their pronouns. So we'll cue this up and let you watch this before we dive into our worship service. Good morning. So glad that you can join us. Hi, I'm Jackson Bird. I'm a YouTuber and writer from New York City. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I also happen to be a trans guy. Pronouns are words we use to refer to each other or to objects when we aren't using their names. I used one right now, there. That's a pronoun. Most of us just learn about she, her, and he, him as pronouns for individual people, but lots of people use other pronouns like they, them, z, here, and more. Sometimes people get confused or even upset about these more gender neutral pronouns as if it's somehow a personal affront on them, but we naturally use singular they them pronouns without thinking about it. Like if you saw an abandoned phone at a cafe, you might tell the barista, hey, someone left their phone behind. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the singular they pronoun has been in use in the English language since at least the 16th century. For us trans people who have maybe had to work very hard to be seen in the world as the gender that we are, pronouns are particularly powerful. If you're a cisgender person, in other words, someone whose gender aligns with the one you were assigned at birth, just imagine what it would feel like if everyone insisted on referring to you with a different pronoun than the one you use. It's frustrating, it's demeaning, it feels like no one is listening to you or respecting a core part of who you are. And that is why someone's pronouns aren't optional. What they tell you their pronouns are, that's the pronouns you use. They aren't a preference, and they aren't up to you to decide which pronouns to use for someone else. That's something we all get to declare for ourselves. And quick pro tip, even when you're talking about someone in the past tense, maybe telling a story about them before they transitioned, you should still use the name and pronouns they currently use. If you've already exchanged names, you can start the question by saying, hey, by the way, I use he, him pronouns. What about you? It's always good to say your pronouns too. Don't just ask theirs, because again, you're making them feel like the odd one out as opposed to welcoming them in. I first started experimenting with he, him pronouns with trusted friends long before I came out publicly, because for me, those pronouns were an important part of my male identity that I wanted to get used to and see if they felt right. A weird thing about pronouns is that even when they do feel right, they can still feel uncomfortable for a while as you get used to them. Like, even if your old pronouns never felt right, you likely did use the same pronouns for many, many years, and change can take time to adjust to. And here's another little secret. At least at the start, we trans people sometimes use the wrong pronoun in our heads for ourselves. Doesn't mean we're not on the right path or not trans or whatever, it just means that brains are weird and it's okay for change to take time. Now, if after all of that, you still trip up and say the wrong pronoun, here's what to do. Correct yourself and move on. Don't make a big deal out of it. Plenty of people have brain farts and misspeak all the time, but the more you treat it like a quick slip up, the more the other person might believe it actually was just a slip up and the less likely you are to put them in danger. Hopefully you won't have to educate them too much, but if they're super lost and you don't feel like being a teacher that day because you don't have to be a teacher every day of your life, maybe point them towards this video or even my book. I have a book called Sorted, Growing Up, Coming Out and Finding My Place. Join us on October 29th at 6 p.m. via Zoom for Altars of Remembrance. 
In your home, you'll create a simple altar in any style or tradition meaningful to you on which to place photographs and personal mementos. The service will include readings, music, and an opportunity to share aloud remembrances and stories of your loved ones. The Zoom meeting ID is 850-7304-9730 and can also be found in your Sunday morning email. For any questions, please contact Ann Deminoff at the underscore dem at comcast.net. And don't forget that all South Church friends are invited to carve a pumpkin and send a photo along for our annual pumpkin carving contest. Entries are due by midnight on Thursday, October 29th. We will have congregation-wide voting on Friday, October 30th and Saturday, October 31st, and there will be prizes. Join us for winning results and a Monster Mash dance party on Zoom from 7 to 7.30 on Halloween night. Send your photos to Jen Del Deo at South Church uu.org. The South Church Spiritual Book Group is hosting a discussion of Jefferson's Daughters, Three Sisters, White and Black, in a Young America by Katherine Carrison on Wednesday, November 11th at 7 p.m. All are welcome. Please contact South Church Book Group at gmail.com for the Zoom link. And finally, it's time to sign up and sing with the South Church Virtual Holiday Choir. We will provide you with all of the, yet you need music wise to make your recordings along with easy instructions. Sign up by contacting choir president Theo Wigand at theodore.wigand at gmail.com or reach out with any questions to Joanne Connolly at joanna sing at aol.com. And when I rise, let me rise like a bird joyfully. And when I fall, let me fall like a leaf gracefully without regret. And when I rise, let me rise like a bird joyfully. And when I fall, let me fall like a leaf gracefully without regret Just as long as I have breath I must answer yes to life Though with pain I made my way Still with hope I meet each day If they ask what I did well Tell them I said yes to life Just as long as vision lasts I must answer yes to truth In my dream and in my dark Always that elusive spark If they ask what I did well Tell them I said yes to truth Just as long as my heart beats I must answer yes to love Disappointment pierced me through Still I kept on loving you If they ask what I did best Tell them I said yes to
I'm speaking to you from the woods behind my house. I would like to acknowledge the Native Americans on whose land I sit, the Abenakis and the Penobscot. Every day since the first day of spring, March 20th, I've been collecting my binoculars, my journal and pen, my reading glasses, and I've headed out to this very spot. I dress for the weather, full rain gear this spring, full mosquito netting late spring and summer, pants tucked into my socks to prevent ticks. I walk carefully and quietly around the side of my house, over the stone wall, past the down tree and dried up vernal pool, until I reach the chair I placed here. It's a perfect chair, my neighbor's discarded old bar stool with a back that allows me to silently turn around to see what's behind me. I sit equidistant from the vernal pool and the crest of the rocky rise behind me. I have sat on this sit spot for almost 200 consecutive days, for 25 minutes or more. I have sat, I have watched, I have listened, I have felt, and I have ridden. I've learned about the surface tension of a water drop as it falls off a branch. I've watched the death throes of a moth as it struggles to escape the web it's caught in. I've watched a black ant carry a white moth twice its size, tens of feet, across the leaf litter, stopping every foot or two to open and close the wings. I've seen two young squirrels chasing each other around and around a two-foot diameter tree for five minutes without stopping, until I wasn't sure if it was two squirrels or a hundred. I've been surprised by a red-shouldered hawk silently flying by me close enough to touch. I've learned to recognize the huff of the doe speaking to her young. I felt the gaze of this doe staring at me for 18 minutes from the top of the rise behind me. I've watched the vernal pool that once was overflowing with water slowly dry up so it, so no, so it no longer smells of organic matter, and the catbird no longer comes to bathe. I've watched a young weasel practice its hunting skills, chasing the squirrels up a white pine tree, only to be chased back down by them. And I have been led by a blue jay to the sanctity of its nest, where it met its mate, and together they fed their two young. The young with necks outstretched, calling and begging for food. I've spent the last six months listening to the land and its inhabitants. I've experienced the ebb and flow of life in these woods. There's a world of wonder outside my door that I never truly stopped to listen to. I wonder what's outside your door if you stop and listen. As we light the chalice in the sanctuary, we invite you to light a chalice of your own. We light the chalice with these words from Richard Power's novel, The Overstory. That's the trouble with people, their root problem. Life runs alongside them, unseen, right here, right next. Creating the soil, cycling the water, trading in nutrients, making weather, building atmosphere, feeding, and curing and sheltering more kinds of creatures than people know how to count. A chorus of living wood sings to the woman, if your mind were only slightly greener thing, we drown you in meaning. The pine she leans against says, listen, there's something you need to hear. Please join me in reciting our mission statement. The words are displayed on your screen. At South Church, we nurture spiritual growth through worship, learning, and community. We celebrate the worth and dignity of all people and inspire one another to act on our faith in the larger community. Good morning, everybody. 
I'm happy to be with you this morning and I have a story to tell. It's called Coco's First Day of School. Once upon a time, there was a kid named Coco. Coco had rosy cheeks and bouncy brown curls and bright eyes that were always watching the world around them. Coco was an only child. They lived with their grandpa in a little house at the edge of town and Coco and their pop loved each other a lot. They weren't perfect. Some days one of them would be in a grumpy mood or someone would get frustrated with someone else, but most days they just practiced loving each other. They would say out loud things they appreciated about one another. They would remind each other that they cared about one another. They would encourage each other and they would look out for the folks in their town and think about ways to give of their time and hearts. And maybe more than anything else, they were very good at listening to one another. Coco didn't go to school when they were young. They were homeschooled, which was just fine to Coco. School with Pop meant the park down the street was a classroom. And so was the garden and the museum in the city nearby. Coco and Pop would do research projects at the library and they would interview people in town about what work they did for a living. But then just after Coco's 11th birthday, Pop had an accident and broke his hip. He was okay, but the doctors said he would be in a wheelchair for quite a while as he healed and he would have to do a lot of therapy to get better. Pop decided it would be best for Coco to go to school Pop was laying in his bed when he told Coco this plan, and he could tell Coco was kind of nervous about the idea. I don't know how to be around other kids, Pop. How, how will I know what to say? How will I know what to ask? Pop smiled. Coco, he said, I know you will do just fine, but I'm going to give you something very special just to be sure. And Pop reached out and opened his hand and in the middle of his silky palm, there was a piece of thin glass curved like a C. Take this, he said, and wear it on your ear. No one will ever notice it's there, but this ring does something very special. When you wear it, you can hear the true heart of anyone around you. And if you know someone's true heart, then you will know just how to be with them. Well, Coco was amazed that Pop had such a magical thing. The next morning, Coco woke up, got dressed, slipped the glass ring around their ear, and headed off to school. Sure enough, that ring was something special. The second Coco walked into class, they could tell that the teacher was kind and patient. Coco listened to the kids, and in math class, he could tell the boy in the chair next to them was feeling confused. Coco scooted closer and showed him how to solve the problem and the kids smiled. At lunch, Coco listened to the chat at the table and figured out that one of the kids was sad. Coco found a minute during recess to ask that classmate if they were okay. They confessed that their dog had just died. But they looked at Coco and said, thanks for asking. And for checking on me, it feels good to tell someone. Then toward the end of the day, Coco caught up to a girl from class that had shared a book report about horses. Coco could tell how much she loved horses when she was sharing the report. And so Coco had decided to give her a small horse figurine that had been clipped to Coco's backpack. Her face lit up like the sun when she saw that little figurine. After school, Coco ran most of the way home. They came bursting into the house calling Pop's name. I can't believe you gave me this amazing magic ring, Pop. All day, I could hear people's true hearts. I just knew how to be with them. Pop was sitting up in his bed, but he looked a little bit worried. Coco, he said, I have to confess something to you. That glass ring, it isn't magic at all. I don't understand, said Coco. Well, said Pop, I thought you might be worried about going to school and I felt bad that I couldn't be there. And 
I wanted to give you something to help you feel brave. But Coco, you never needed any help at all. You have always been such a good listener. And when you take time to listen to people, that's all you need to hear their true hearts loud and clear. Coco looked at the ring and up at Pop for a moment. They felt a little embarrassed that they believed the ring was magic. But then they thought about the day. They thought about how they had paid special attention to what they were hearing because of that ring. They thought about how it reminded them to really listen. And they thought about the smiles of the new friends they'd made. Thanks for telling me, Pop, Coco said. And thanks for giving me the ring, too. I think it really did help today. Coco gave their grandpa a really big hug and headed to the kitchen to make a snack. They never wore the ring after that, but they kept it on a shelf to remind, remember that listening, it's a pretty magic thing. I miss you all. I hope you're doing good. I can't wait to see you. Don't forget to carve a pumpkin and send us a picture for the pumpkin carving contest. Hi, my name is Melissa Lohr, and I want to talk to you about South Church's annual budget campaign and the importance of keeping a roof over our heads now more than ever. Growing up, my mother was a crier. Birthdays, weddings, first day of school, last day of school, hellos, God forbid, goodbyes, cue the waterworks. More striking than her tears, though, was her shame. Mom couldn't cry without apologizing. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me. I didn't know what was wrong with her either. All I knew was that I didn't want any part of it. So I learned to swallow my tears, suppress them, stuff them deep down. Until I came to South Church. And under that old slate roof, I turned into my mother. Hearing my kids recite the mission statement brought tears to my eyes. I cried through countless hymns. Sometimes, instead of listening to the sermon, I just stared at the sunlight coming in through those beautiful clear glass windows, and I cried. I didn't know where all the tears came from. I still don't, really. All I know is that South Church gave me a safe space, a roof over my head, where I could cry all I needed to, and I didn't need to apologize. Tears of joy, love, sorrow, grief, disappointment, it didn't matter. I'd found a home where all my feelings could be felt. I need that roof over my head now. That's why my family has decided to increase our annual pledge to South Church this year. My tears are real, but they're impermanent. COVID is real. Today's political climate is unfortunately real, but they too are impermanent. The new slate roof that the ABC contributions will help build is impermanent too. But if we do it right, my daughter's daughters and my son's sons will have a roof over their heads whenever they need a good cry or a good laugh. May it be so. It's now time for our morning offering so that we can continue to do the important work within our congregation and in the larger community. This month, our shared plate recipient is Seacoast Outright, an organization that advocates for and supports LGBTQ plus youth in the Seacoast area. They provide space and freedom for youth to explore issues related to sexual orientation and gender identity with conversations facilitated by trained, experienced adult facilitators. They also provide support for parents and caregivers. And as you've heard from a member of our ABC team, within our congregation, whether we meet in the building or not, we still need to maintain our building and pay our hard-working staff 
who continue to do the work required to support us and help fulfill our spiritual needs. May our efforts help us do this. You can give online via the donate link on our website or send a check in the mail to our office at 73 Court Street in Portsmouth. Details are on your screen. I also wanted to note that you can set up a recurring donation so that you can continue to support our congregation even on those weeks when you may be unavailable to attend the service. Thank you for your generosity. Shalom Havarim, Shalom Havarim, Shalom, Shalom. Love is proud, love is proud, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom Havarim, Shalom Havarim, Shalom. roses, thorns, studs. These events that happen in our life bring us joy or cause us concern or they're sticky points. And we know that life is full of all of that, full of joy and full of concerns and full of little things that get us concerned and cause us pain. In the place that I'm living right now, there's these beautiful rose bushes with old fashioned rose bushes growing around them and they're blossoming and blooming. And the other day I took a pair of scissors and went out and cut some of those blooms and placed them on the counter, placed them in water and was realizing that the roses placed in water, that life giving element and the roses with their unfolding. And as I watch the little buds that I put in there gradually begin to open, I was realizing that life is like that, that we find our sources that give us strength, that we have sources that nourish us like water, and we have beauty <clears throat> that surrounds us like those roses. And that when I wasn't careful, I did stick my finger with one of those thorns. Life is like that. Life is full of beauty. Life is full of things that give us joy, that fill our senses. And life also has its moments and its times when things really, really hurt. So we want you to know that you're not alone, that we care about you, that we think about you, that we hold you in our hearts, that we are here for you. Please take a moment of silent reflection and hold in your heart all those concerns that others have expressed. And may you know and experience life's pleasures like beautiful roses. May it be so.
Do you listen better if someone shouts or whispers? Do you listen better if someone looks in your eyes as they speak or speak across the room? Do you listen better if there is limited amount of background distractions or if there are background distractions? Silly questions, because of course I suspect that we listen better to whispers and we listen better when engaged intimately and in direct visual contact and listen better when giving full attention to the words rather than trying to hear over background noises. And this is so because really and truly listening is really and truly about paying attention to another. One of the good things about Zoom and other platforms of communication that we have been using during these COVID times is that it forces us to listen closely to each other, to speak one at a time, to weigh our words before jumping into conversations and the bad things about this means of communication is that the more subtle ways of communicating are dulled and less accessible. It is much harder to read what someone might be feeling too, because it is harder to engage all of our senses to truly listen and have deep listening and paying attention. Listening and paying attention is not something that happens without some practice and intentionality. And even more so during this time of social separation, it is important to practice deep listening. I like to take time each day to listen more intently. As is the case with all of us, the visual senses that I encounter every day can be staggering. Television, radio, email, snail mail, moving vehicles, flashing neon and safety lights, advertising, flyers, newspapers, and masses of people are a daily bombardment. Oftentimes I do not even know that I am on sensory overload until I feel a tightness in my jaw and an impatience in my mind, and until I become aware that I am being less than attentive to others. And this is when in my time, when I know it is time to pay attention and shift from overload to truly listening. So what do I listen to? I listen to nature. I listen to the rustling of the wind, the flutter of tree branches and leaves falling and birds singing. I listen to my footsteps on the ground as I walk and the noises in the Kittery neighborhood I just moved to, a neighborhood I moved to in order to be close to you for the winter. I also listen to the quiet voice of friends and family as we share a meal or a story or soothing music. I listen to the sound of my own breathing and silence. And you know what? Sometimes that silence can be absolutely deafening. This reminds me that it is important to think about listening and paying attention with our ears. One of my favorite authors, Alice Walker, wrote in her book, The Temple of My Familiar, about her husband. I was attracted to him because he was one giant big ear. <laughs> well, in order to stay in and be in right relationship with others, it is important to be attentive and to practice becoming one big ear. How comforting is that really though, to know that when we share our deepest struggles, thoughts and wonderments, our intimate partners are one big giant ear. But as important as ears are at paying attention, deep listening really involves intentionally engaging all of our senses, paying attention. I love this story about Elizabeth Peabody. She was an early Unitarian educator and leader who lived in the 1800s. She never married and was considered a bit eccentric because she was so innovative in her thinking and her lifestyle. 
One day, as was her habit, she was out walking in the Boston Common, ruminating on some theological, philosophical conundrum. And she walked right smack dab into a large tree, actually knocking herself to the ground and giving herself quite a bruise on her forehead. And those around her who witnessed this ran up and after being sure she was okay said, but Elizabeth, didn't you see the tree? Of course I saw the tree, she answered. <laughs> and no more was said for, isn't it true that we can see lots of trees in front of us? We can see even the biggest tree in front of us and sometimes we can still not be paying attention and walk right smack dab into it. So paying attention means that we must engage all of our senses. The sense of sight involves seeing light waves, which move very fast, much faster than sound. To be exact, light moves at 186,000 miles per second while sound waves move at 1,088 feet per second. Listening means we must slow down. And let's also be clear that listening well does not involve hearing better. I don't hear well, and as I age, my hearing becomes less fine. My mother was right, loud rock, music in my earphones and that Jethro Tull concert and other rock and roll concerts I attended probably caused some damage. However, the loss of hearing should not compromise my listening and I try to not let it do so. I may ask you to repeat your words uh, to say something again, but I have been learning how listening involves developing different skills. Deborah von Dusen Hunsinger, a professor of pastoral theology, identified three skills. I like these. They're ones I try to practice. Accurate paraphrasing, productive questioning, and checking one's perceptions. Carl Rogers, those of you who took psychology will perhaps remember him as the person who taught accurate paraphrasing and empathetic listening, explained it this way. To sense the client's private world as if it were your own, but without ever losing the as if quality. This is empathy and seems essential to therapy, he says, but I say to living. One must pay attention to be able to accurately paraphrase what has been said. It is not guessing what has been said, nor is it adding your own thoughts and opinions to what one has said. It is reflecting key words and thoughts back to the speaker. Productive questioning involves asking open-ended and welcoming questions that clarify meaning. Many of you have engaged in appreciative inquiry, and this is productive questioning at its best. But the hardest skill to develop and to become comfortable with is the skill that makes us check our perceptions. And one of the first ways to develop this is to become conscious of how we listen and learn to identify reactions. There are certain ways that are almost automatic when listening. And if you are honest about this and honest with yourself, you get to know them. First, we almost always take what someone says and put it alongside our own experiences, turning and molding the expressed thoughts of another until it fits our own experiences. And then when we respond, we use our thoughts and our examples to talk or speak to the other. And second, we have both been guilty of and victims of this, we don't wait until the other person is done speaking, but jump in to offer our words. And third, there are words or phrases that have emotional overtones that influence what we are hearing. 
So checking our perceptions and practicing good listening helps us to not become victim, nor to continue to do this to others. So let me give one example of a study done that confirms this. And there could be many more, but this one's interesting. A group of people were shown a film of two cars colliding. One week later, they were broken into two groups and one group was asked how fast were the cars going when they bumped into each other and whether there was any broken glass. And the other group was asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. And each other of the smashed into group reported that there was broken glass when in fact there was none and they reported that the cars were going much faster than had been recorded. And this is just one example of the need to check our perceptions. For we all have memories and perceptions and words that greatly influence how we listen. So listen to the difference in your perceptions as I say these following phrases. A rally or a protest? Most controversial, most important. Focus on differences or search for common ground. Win the argument, understand another point of view. The other side and other side. Did you notice what happened to you when you were thinking about these phrases? What memory or image of past experience or interactions were triggered when you heard different words and phrases? And how often have we been in a conversation with a partner or a spouse or friend and suddenly be reminded that they sound just like our mother or our father or our ex? Remember, our memory is a powerful force for good or ill in how we perceive those around us. And sometimes our listening is more a reaction to past images and memories than to current words. Listen for this and other challenges. Listen not to confirm your own opinions or perspectives. Listen not to hear evidence that affirms your point but instead that may broaden your view. Deep listening requires this of us. Martin Buber, the Jewish theologian, taught about the I and thou relationship. And of course, one of the big challenges facing us as humans and in all of our interactions is how to maintain our individual selfhood while at the same time maintaining relationships with the other. Two-year-olds practice this very well with the no attitude that marks this age, or adolescents who say, you are not the boss of me. This learning to be separate yet connected is a lifetime process. And the I, thou, is a mindset that helps us to deepen our spiritual connections with others and to know ourselves. Buber came to understand faith and religion not as a pursuit of some ecstatic experience, but as a life of attentiveness to others and the experience of the divine and the deep experience of interconnectedness, deep listening. Paying attention to another is positively the most affirming act of love we can extend to another. It is the way to see the divine in each other. It is the I and the thou and the divine in between. So let us try to see how this is so as we commit ourselves anew to paying attention to one another. So may it be.
guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Hold my hand while I run this race, hold my hand while I run this race, hold my hand while I run this race. race in vain. Stand by me while I run this race. Stand by me while I run this race. Stand by me while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we're together again. And yet again, we've gathered for virtual worship. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that this is the way that we express ourselves? Who would have thought that being in touch with one another meant crossing the miles, seeing each other, in this kind of platform. And who would have thought that the warmth and love and the care that this community has for one another would be so able to be expressed in a virtual platform. And it is. I am so very grateful to be with you. I applaud all the work that is being done. It has been a time of deep listening It has been a time of deep knowing. And I want you to go forward and listen carefully. The world is beautiful. And South Church has something to bring into the world, a beauty all of its own. Go in peace. Go in love. May it be so.
Here are some ways that you can give to South Church. To make your 2021 pledge, fill out and mail your financial commitment form to South Church at 73 Court Street in Portsmouth, or send an email to the Annual Budget Committee Chair, Lori Bilby, at turningtide at comcast.net. To pay your pledge or to make donations, go to the South Church website, southchurch-uu.org, click on the donate button on the top and follow the prompts. You can also mail us a check to South Church at 73 Court Street in Portsmouth, noting the type of gift that you are making. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out at 603-436 4762 or by emailing info at southchurch-uu.org.